Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Aino. I'm from the School of Chemical and Energy Engineering, uh, Faculty of Engineering, UTM. Um, I'll be your MC today. Um, today, we are very um, uh, fortunate to have the presence of uh, uh, our one of our collaborators uh, from all the way from India. He is uh, Professor Sunil Kumakari from the Institute of uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, IITD. And he'll be sharing some of his expertise in the uh, in the area of, of uh, extreme enzymes. So um, um, last year, uh, Professor Sunil and his entourage uh, visited UTM, and the whole idea was uh, to discuss on how to um, further uh, make some uh, um, uh, useful programs, uh, mutually beneficial programs between IITD and UTM. So I'm happy to share that uh, uh, the university is very supportive of this. And in the near future, uh, there'll be some uh, uh, MOU signing between IITD and UTM. And uh, hopefully with the MOU, uh, there'll be a lot more of uh, uh, visible and also mutually beneficial progress between our both institutions. Yeah. So maybe a little bit how we get to know each other. So um, both of us, we uh, sometimes we were invited to attend uh, some conferences in, 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 in India. So that's, that's where we get to know each other. And always uh, after our presentation, we will invite people to come. And uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, Prof. Sunil did come to UTM and hopefully one day, all of us also can visit uh, IITD either as uh, for our research attachment, yeah, for our uh, maybe short stint, hopefully we get more uh, uh, information uh, or more opportunities to do that kind of activity in the future. Okay, so without uh, further ado, I would like to invite our distinguished dean uh, for Faculty of Engineering, Professor Rafi, to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Professor Zainul, for sharing, moderating the session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my, uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to our 58th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Sunil Kumar Khari from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, India. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Professor Sunil Kumar Khari holds the position of a Professor of Biochemistry and Institute Chair Professor at IIT Delhi. An alumnus of IIT Delhi, he received his doctoral degree in biochemistry in 1990 and did his postdoctoral research at National Food Research Institute, Tsukuba, Japan. Professor Hari has more than 30 years of academic and industrial research experience with 160 plus publications and patents. His current noteworthy contributions have been in the area of differential proteomics, of solvent tolerance, halophilic class of extremophiles, and deciphering nanotoxic mechanisms in plants and microbial systems. He has been invited as visiting professor to the University of Blaise Pascal, France, in 2014 and 2018. He was a visiting fellow at Northern Regional Research Lab in USA in 2006. Professor Curry has been honored with awards like the United Nations MA Award in 1998, Malavia Memorial Award Senior Faculty, BRSI, in 2018. He is also an elected fellow of prestigious societies like the Royal Society of Chemistry, FRSC, International Forum on Industrial Bioprocesses Fund, Biotech Research Society of India Fellow, India fellow of BRSI. Fellow of National Academy of Sciences, India, Fellow Academy of Microbiological Sciences, and UNU Kirin Fellow, Japan. Additionally, he is appointed as the current Vice President of BRSI India and the Joint Secretary of AMI India. He has been a member of several professional societies and has served on several committees and scientific advisory boards. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Sunil Kumar Khari, 
from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, with a talk entitled Extremozymes, Life Under Extremes. Professor Sunil Kumar Fari, over to you. Thank you, Professor Rafiq. Uh, I am really uh, delighted to be part of the Distinguished Lecture Series from UTM. And I thank you and Professor Zenul for giving me this opportunity. And I am very pleased to share my work with the audience. Uh, ho hopefully, I'm able to justify the distinguished lecture series very well organized by UTM. Um, good afternoon and salamat and salam alaikum. So my I'll start my talk with some presentation. Okay, so uh, this is sorry for a while. I took uh, some time to adjust this. So, extremo giants I'm going to share in this lecture series. Before that, let me share. Uh, we come from India, and I am placed at New Delhi, which is capital of India. This is map of the country. And when you come to India, I think Professor General has already come here. Uh, we have some historical monuments, what we call as India Gate in Delhi. And this is the city center of Delhi. We also have some historical monuments in Delhi. For example, we have a uh, structure called very prestigious religious structure, the Jama Masjid, which was built in 1644. We also have another structure called Qutub Minar, which was built in 1192. So it, that way, Delhi is quite historical city. And we have a red fort here, which was built by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan in 1639. Some of the new structures have also come up in Delhi. So you have a lotus temple, which is looks like a lotus, and then another structure from Akshatham temple. Indian cuisine, like Malaysian cuisine, is also we have variety of foods. And when you come here, you can enjoy some of the Indian foods. And I come from and here in New Delhi, I work at Indian Institute of Technology. This institute was established in 1961 as College of Engineering. And two years ago, it is given the status of Institute of Eminence from Government of India. This, we have about 10,000 students and 600 faculty members who are quite decorated. We roughly publish about 2,000 papers per year. And till date, this institute has awarded about 50,000 PhD degrees. Um, we have all the engineering departments in IIT. We have applied mechanics. We have biochemical engineering, chemical engineering, civil engineering, computer sciences, design, electrical engineering, material science, mechanical engineering, and even the textile technology. We have basic sciences department, physics, chemistry, maths, and biology. We also have humanities and management department. Uh, beside the department structure, we also have certain centers which work on the specialized research problems for instance, we have a center for electronics, atmospheric sciences, biomedical engineering, rural development, and value education, and energy, etc. Uh, we recently opened a few schools also, which do the which are specialized in some research topics. For instance, we have telecommunication institute uh, school, we have school of IT, we have a school of biological sciences, a school of public policy and one school which is interdisciplinary research. The Institute offers 
undergraduate program, the BTEC degree in all the disciplines. We also offer master's program giving MSc and MTech degrees. And then we also go for PhD. Besides that, we exchange number of students from other universities. So you can see IITs are actually having collaboration with almost every country you can see on the map. And I was very fortunate to visit UTM last year, thanks to Professor General to invite me. So there was a team from IIT you can see on the screen and I'm, I'm feeling very nostalgic to see UTM here and UTM and entry to the UTM. Hello, hello and salam alaikum. Uh, in the UTM lecture series, I'm going to share my research on extremozymes as a novel biocatalyst. This is life at extreme. So, uh, and I will more focus on the enzymes from these organisms. So enzymes are very prized commodity worldwide. They have billion dollars of market actually. So people do demand enzyme in the industry for various specific applications. And but for an enzyme to be applicable or useful in industry, it has to be stable because industrial conditions are very harsh either acidic or alkaline or high or low temperatures, high salt is there sometime in the process, there are organic solvents. So, but enzymes coming from um, live systems are fragile. So industry demand stable enzymes. For this reason, there have been number of researches, but how to stabilize the enzyme. You can chemically modify them, one can immobilize them on some solid support. You must have heard a title called engineering. So enzyme engineering is another way to stabilize the enzyme, directed evolution. But what we propose and are doing in our lab is screening the extremophiles. So again, the question comes, what are extremophiles? By classical definition, any organism especially the microorganism, which lives under high extreme conditions are called extremophile or extreme loving. Now for any organism to work under extreme conditions, they have to do all the physiological function and catalysis and cellular reactions under extreme conditions. So the enzyme which are present inside the cell in these extremophiles are tough and they call extremozyme. For instance, thermophiles are one class of extremophiles which grow at very high temperature. So I can tell you and they are their microorganisms which are present even hot springs. So pyrococcus puricus grows above 100 degrees. So its enzyme can be a source of very heat stable enzymes. Psychrophiles are the microorganism which grows at very low temperature. Even in Antarctica, you will find certain microorganism and famous candida Antarctica came from, um, um, from that region. And uh, we have acidophiles, we have Alkali files, which grow under alkaline condition. What I'm going to focus in this talk is the halophiles. These are the organisms which grow under high salt in seawater or sea pan. So they actually are growing at a salt concentration two molar or above. So their enzymes are tough enzymes. Their enzymes are efficient enzymes and we call them extremozymes. I can give you one example which most of the students can understand or most of the audience can understand tag polymerase. This tag polymerase is used for PCR reaction because of its thermal stability. Before tag polymerase, it was not possible to do the PCR. LB is another example. But I can share with you that over the 3.3 million protein sequences available in the data protein database, only 8% correspond to extremophiles, so they need to be worked out more. Now, as, as I said, I will focus on halophiles. So halophiles are those microorganisms which grow under salt conditions. 
so they they can sustain life at very high salt concentration just a basic principle of science if you put a live cell in salt solution actually it will shrivel water will come out of it it will shrink and it will not survive but halophilic cells even in presence of salts they survive how do they survive either they have equivalent amount of salt inside their cytoplasm inside their cell or they have some small molecules which are called halo tolerant or compatible solute so these solutes are amino acids sugars polyols betaines ectoines they make the osmo uh, osmotic behavior of the cell to sustain in the salt but the second strategy which is there is that these cells or these microorganisms accumulate similar amount of salt in their cytoplasm so if there is a salt or solvent inside the cell to sustain the cell in saline water then all the enzymes of proteins which are present inside the cells have to function in presence of salt so they are better for synthesis of peptides they are useful as detergent enzymes they give a new model to understand structure and function relationship in the protein and they are quite useful for hypersaline waste treatment we started research asking few questions can there be a repository for normal uh, for novel enzymes from halophiles do they possess some unique properties which are not present in normal cells can the enzyme or proteins from halophilic organisms be purified because typically when you want to purify some protein from a live cell you need some chromatographic procedures but if in any chromatographic procedure you put high salt the chromatography doesn't work and if you don't put the salt your cell will die the halophilic cells will die so a question is how to purify proteins or enzymes from halophilic organisms third question which we were asking was why and how their enzymes are stable at low water or high salt hmm? last question was how can we use them for industrial application so with this we started the research and we isolated number of halophilic microorganism from different saline habitats of india so these are some of the habitats you see salt all around salt is there and one can see uh, the microorganism here here and here so we collected sample from there we isolated those microorganisms from those sea water samples and we saw that the number of microorganisms they need high amount of salt for example ranging from 5 molar 5% nacl to 15% nacl for their survival we identified their gene uh, whole genome and we found that they are geomicrobium or marinobacter or virgilobacillus so we could identify these microorganism from different saline habitats okay these are couple of and we have a repository of such halophilic microorganisms in our lab now we know which one is what and how much salt they need in in general they are chromobacter halomonas marinobacter etc these are the major classes of halophiles we obtained from indian coastal saline coastal saline water and they produce good enzymes so we took out the enzymes from them and try to understand are their enzyme different than normal enzymes so we found that their enzymes have alkaline ph normally they do need enzyme also need salt to function their enzymes normal enzymes don't need salt to function but in this case unless you give nacl they will not catalyze the reaction more specifically we found that they are stable in organic solvent so the basic chemistry tells us that if you put any protein or enzyme in organic solvent it will actually denature 
but the enzymes coming from halophilic source do remain stable in salt and in solvent. So we found many such actually. So our conclusion was that halophilic microorganisms coming from saline water can be new source of solvent stable and salt stable enzymes and their enzymes are also alkaline. That means if you remember I said they can work under alkaline industrial processes. They can work at the industrial process which is operational at high salt. They can work for an industrial process where organic solvent is present. Why they are tolerating solvent? This was a new thing to us because when there is a high salt, the water is low. If the low water becomes something like organic solvent, and so they are stable in organic solvent and salt. Now the advantage one can ask, what is so big about it saying that this is solvent stable? So I can tell you a basic reaction. If there is a reaction and there is an enzyme, if water is present, you can actually hydrolyze this substrate into two different you know, products. This is called hydrolysis. But if you don't give water, but put organic solvent, then I can carry this reaction in reverse direction. So if I have A and B and I don't have water, but I have organic solvent, it can form this product. That's how if you know the diabetic people, they use uh, the aspartame as a sweetener. That's a dipeptide. So that dipeptides can be synthesized by putting an enzyme thermolysine in hexane and thermolyse and this aspartame is produced. So this is the example uh, that, so it's there is a demand. We want to synthesize oligosaccharides. We want to synthesize esters. All the time, whenever we want to synthesize some compound, we need enzymes which are stable in organic solvent. <clears throat> so they can be good source of salt stable, alkaline stable and solvent stable enzyme. My second question was how we can purify them. So in this case, um, I'm giving one example where this bacteria called geomicrobium, a halophile came from a lake. It's a salt lake. You can see here in India. And this microorganism was isolated from this salt lake and it was producing good amount of protease. Now to purify this protease, when we want to use it for industrial purposes, we need to take it out, separate it out, isolate it, purify it actually. So what we did, we tried a technique called hydrophobic interaction chromatography. In this case, what happens? The chromatographic matrix is hydrophobic, here phenyl sephiro. So if you recall something like HPLC, where the column is hydrophobic actually. Mm. So in this case also, we took the hydrophobic matrix and then we added the this bacterial culture supernatant. And what we found was that since this was solvent stable, we thought it may have hydrophobic characteristics. And yes, it did. It bind to this column and come out as a pure protein in single shot. So we were able to purify by this. Now you can question, I was saying that throughout the chromatography, salt is required. Yes, in this case, salt is given. So salt is there and we bind the protein and it is purified 22% fold periods. 22 times purification was there with very high specific activity. Then one can question that, is it really pure and is it really protease? So we can show this is a single band. And when we did activity staining, actually, uh, we found that it is protease. So we could purify this protease by this technique called hydrophobic interaction chromatography. This technique works very well in case of halophilic protein separation. And this protein particularly was a small molecular weight protein. We did the same thing, another enzyme, another microorganism, Marinobacter, and we grew it actually. We, we got it from seawater of Kerala, the south part of country, and then we could also purify this uh, by putting salt. We also got another producer and we did the some techniques and we could purify as a pure enzyme. We got another halophile and we could purify, another bacteria and we purified. So what we wanted to tell here is that 
purification can be achieved by HIC or gel permeation. Even in ion exchange chromatography, if salt is added, it is possible to purify. But purification by hydrophobic interaction chromatography does not necessitate anything else, but in a single step, you can purify uh, the halophilic proteins. Then we try to understand that we pure, now this is pure enzymes with us from these microorganisms. And we found that these enzymes are small molecular weight enzymes. They have pH optima in alkaline range sometime. They also have temperature stability beyond 50 degree. And they require 1% salt. If you don't give them salt, they will not catalyze the reaction. They are stable in presence of detergent. I will tell at the end why this is important, uh, that they are compatible with the detergent. We did, we did characterize them. They were serine protease. They had KM, good KM and Vmax. So this is the property. Then the question which came to the mind is, why a protein and how a protein is stable in salt and low water? What is the molecular basis of the stability of these proteins in salt and solvent? So what we did actually, we basically, this is a typical, uh, you know, to make you understand that we can isolate this gene, we can ligate it with a vector, we can clone in some cell and transform it, and then we can grow it and we can get a recombinant, uh, you know, kind of, a kind of expression of these pro en enzyme or protein and we can further characterize it. So here we see, we got a protease, we actually gave the plasmid, we expressed it, and we can prove it by again giving the restriction digestion that we were able to insert this protein and express it. Now, once we got it, uh, we actually wanted to understand the structure. So we saw that this protein, uh, that this geomicrobium protease has got quite a bit of hydrophobic amino acids, okay? And quite a bit of charged amino acid. This was our understanding. We sequenced the entire protease and we found these characteristics. Now, after sequencing, when we went for the structural modeling of this protease, the halophilic protease, we found that surface of this protease is quite a bit of hydrophobic. This yellow thing is hydrophobic amino acid residues. So this is the reason they are stable in solvent because if this is hydrophobic, solvent is also hydrophobic and it can remain stable. That's why it is solvent stable. So our conclusion is that these proteins coming from marine sources or saline sources are hydrophobic in nature, in surface, and that's what makes them stable in organic solvents. Another thing which we found by this structure is that there's a lot of charged amino acid res uh, residues on the surface. You can see lots of glutamic acid, lysine on the surface. This gives them they form bond between NaCl and the, this acidic or basic amino acids. And that's why this protein is stable in the salt and it requires salt. So this structural phenomena basically represent why these proteins are stable, why marine microorganism and their protein are stable in salt and organic solvent because their surface is lined with the acidic or basic amino acid, along with lots of hydrophobic residues. Um, here, what we are showing is that salt is required. If you don't give 1% salt, they, they have less of activity. If you give solvents, they are quite stable, okay, except in one case, which was polar. So solvent, they sustain themselves, their activity up to 72 hours in presence of all the solvents, benzene, Tolvin, dodecan, decane, etc. Now, this picture is showing a CD spectra of this protease. CD spectra tells you about the secondary structure of the protein. And typically, this shows alpha helix of the protein. So, you will see that if this protein or protease coming from geomicrobium 
is not given any salt, this structure is lost. And if a structure is lost, the activity will be lost. That's why we are saying that in absence of salt, it is not able to catalyze the reaction. But if I start giving salt 1, 2, 5 and 10 percent, it is regaining the structure and giving the reactions. That means salt is necessary or NaCl is necessary for marine proteins or marine enzymes to maintain their secondary structure. Same thing here. In presence of organic solvents, they lose activity. But if the salt is there and organic solvents are there, like D D DMSO or Dekin, etc., but in presence of salt, actually structure is retained and they are stable. So conclusion from this slide is they are solvent stable, but they do need NaCl to maintain the structure. So NaCl in presence of NaCl, they are stable in organic solvents and catalyze the reaction in organic solvent medium. So similarly, we took another microorganism and another enzyme. This is amylase from Marinobacter. This also requires salt. This is also stable in organic solvents. And we also proved here that surface is hydrophobic and charge residues are there. So our hypothesis that because of charge residue and hydrophobic surface, they are stable in organic solvent and salt uh, was confirmed. The same thing, cursory structure is also stable in presence of salt. And similarly, another organism and CD shows that salt, uh, the structure is retained when salt is there. Uh, same thing with other enzymes. So what we, couple of enzymes we used from couple of microorganisms, we could show that surface is hydrophobic and surface is charged. That's why they are stable. So we can say that halophilic proteins are charged and hydrophobic and that's what makes them stable in salt and solvent. Now, this question is, can they be exploited for efficiently for industrial applications? So I'm telling you, and please, uh, please understand that detergent is one of the biggest industry using the enzymes. So you see when there is an oil stain, or a protein stain in your clothes, you need a detergent of high quality so that oil or protein or sugar strain goes away. For that, these commercial detergents have enzyme within them. Otherwise, if there is an oil stain and there is no lipase present, a stain will not go. So there are good detergent and bad detergent. Good detergents have enzymes and they make the even lipid stain or oil stain or protein stain clean. So these are some of the Indian brands actually of the uh, detergents. And now you understand whenever you wash either in Malaysia or India, whenever you wash a cloth, you subject it to washing machine, the temperature is mildly um, beyond, little beyond room temperature. Detergents are actually hydrophobic in nature. They are surfactants actually. So they have amphiphilic molecules are there and they are alkaline, detergents are alkaline, detergents have salt also in with them or washing water has salt. So enzyme to function within a detergent has to be alkaline, has to be stable in salt, has to be stable in presence of detergents and has to be little stable at high temperature. So th all those four qualities are required, alkaline, salt is stable, detergent is stable and slightly temperature is stable. That's why we tested these halophilic proteases along with different detergents. And we found that they are quite stable up to three hours. And here is the example. So this is a blood stain fabric. It's blood. If you take a commercial detergent alone, still some stains are there. But when we took this commercial detergent with our protease, the halophilic protease, it's perfectly clean. So this means these halophilic proteases or lipases are good for detergent industry. And I can tell you the detergent industry enzymes are patented. They don't tell each other which is this enzyme and from where it has come. What we are suggesting is that halophilic proteases could be a good source for detergent enzyme. Halophilic organism could be a good source of detergent enzymes. Second, I was told in the beginning that if you want to synthesize you can carry out reaction in organic solvent. So reverse reaction will take place. 
we took amylase from merino vector and try to synthesize oligosaccharides so you see here that this enzyme in hexane otherwise normal amylase will not do this reaction on halophilic enzymes able to sustain hexane actually catalyze the reverse reaction and we could form maltose maltotriose and maltotriose so that means this enzyme can be good for synthesis this can be good for detergents and another example where we took another protease from another organism and we showed that it works well as a detergent enzyme so these were some of the applications we can conclude that they are detergent good they work well with the detergents the halophilic proteins or enzymes from halophiles works well with detergent and they are good for synthesis also so you can synthesize oligosaccharide you can synthesize peptides you can synthesize even aspartame you can synthesize even esters from them and um this is what we showed with couple of more example where it can be used for x ray film uh, recovery of silver from x ray films we could use them for soya flour hydrolysis so we got a protein hydrolysate which was much better than normal so couple of example where salt is present in the medium or solvent is present in the medium and these enzymes can be use useful there so the carry home message which i would like to give you is that hello files that and also i know johar johar bahru uh, it's a good uh, c line actually it's supposed quite a good c line there you can have very good halophilic uh, microorganisms one can tap their enzymes which could be stable in alkaline and salt uh, alkaline in, uh, medium in salt and solvents so hello files are good source for such enzymes which are required in industry they can be useful for synthesis of the peptide of the esters of the um of the oligosaccharides and they can definitely useful for detergent application so what i would say that hello files are vast resources which can be tapped and people can work on it more organism you can find out more proteins you can find out you can purify them easily you can understand their structure function you can apply them in the industry this is what so actually entire work was done by some of the students who finished their phd degree in this uh, out of these uh, work so one organism one student kind and i thank them my research was supported by government of india department of biotechnology so i must acknowledge them and this is the group our group which is working on uh, extremo files for a long time um and i would like to say harima kashi or many many thanks to audience and my utm friends and utm dean utm uh, professor rafi professor zainul and other faculty colleagues for giving me this chance to share some of my research hope it was useful may be different um, but still if there is any question i will be very glad to take the question okay so thank you very much uh, uh, professor rafi professor jainul and uh, I, if there is any question no, i can no, you need to unmute uh, sorry professor okay. yeah. oh, thank you uh, yeah i can hear you yeah, yeah. yeah okay thank you very much for the nice presentation and so i think you can Kick off your presentation now. Let's get the question from the audience. Do it on the screen. Okay. Uh, maybe we can take some questions from the audience to open the page. Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay, for here we have uh, two questions from the audience from the page. Yeah. So the question is. Will these enzymes affect the color of the textile? 
the real attack fabric and the color of the textile to be improved. Number two, can enzymes be used to factors such as adding to diet of protein? Okay, so um, thank you, Ms. Uh, um, thank you for the question. Hmm. Uh, I think this enzyme will not attack fabric because fa fabric are cellulose. These are cellulose molecules. Fabric are basically cellulosic in nature, and enzymes are very, very, very substrate specific. So, for acting on cellulose, the fabric, you need a cellulase. And the enzyme which we are proposing for detergent are protease, lipase, etc. So they will not attack the cell fabric actually. Fabric is cellulose. So that's first first question, first part is no. Second is color of the textile. Textile color is due to the um, dyes actually. So dye will not be attacked. So that's why enzyme. Enzymes are substrate specific. A protease will only act on protein. Amylase will act only on the carbohydrates, so, so, on, so on and so forth. For dye, you have different enzymes, peroxidases, etc. So, this enzyme will not affect the color, this enzyme will also not affect the fabric texture or anything else. Second question is can this enzyme be used in medicine as such as adding dye to the protein? Uh, uh, the, med the enzyme which are used in medicines are, I can give you one example asparginase which is used for cancer patients actually. or there are other enzymes which are used like antioxidant enzymes for for patients so these enzymes are normally are not medicinal enzymes they are not used for medicine purpose but yes if you find an enzyme let's say asparginase from extremophile which is available with novo this can be given to the patients but the delivery has to be perfect. You need to have a vehicle so that this enzyme can be delivered at the site to the patient. Yes, this can be. Okay, bro. Thank you very much for the answer. Uh, I just want to follow up with your answer just now. You mentioned that an enzyme is a good vehicle for it to yeah. be delivered to the to the yeah. to the environment or, or the site. So to get it. In, in business experience, what are the best enzymes? Uh, to be to be used at uh, the best uh, vehicle for you. You mean vehicle? You're asking the vehicle which can be used yeah. for delivery. Yeah. So I think I can tell you that we have developed some nano flowers or nano particles in the lab which are compatible to the compatible to the living cells actually. Nano particles are some of the nano particles. Let's say let's say um, for example. Kytosan, kytosan nanoparticle or oligosaccharide nanoparticles or protein nanoparticles actually are not toxic for the living cells. You can attach your enzyme with those or encapsulate your enzyme with those nanoparticles and then they can deliver the enzyme inside. Yeah, yeah um, because uh, it's, it's yeah. very important yeah. Yeah. to have a very good delivery system here, bro. Uh, so maybe we have another question so from the uh, our FB audience, maybe the secretary. So, okay, bro, while we are waiting for the uh, questions from the uh, audience, uh, maybe I have uh, some questions for you. You you yes. mentioned earlier part of your work that you. Uh, have some uh, various sites for sampling of the microbe. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have any particular reason for choosing of the site? Okay. Um. Actually, idea was that you see different habitat or site will have different kind of microorganism predominantly present in that area. So, for instance. Salt Lake, the salt concentration there was about 20%. So if I want some extreme halophile, extreme halophile, then I will go to that lake. And I would like to have organisms which are stable up to 20%. Sea water have about 5 to 7% salt. So if I want moderate halophile, I will prefer to go to sea water. Okay, there are salt pans, I can still go further actually accordingly. 
so the choice of habitat or selection of the site depends on what am i looking for if the site is have near a oil factory let's say so for example your uh, johor bahadur so there may be oil where oil is being you know processed nearby you will have organism which will have more lipase activity okay so depending on the kind of thing you are looking for you should choose the site that's what we did it oh yeah bro that's 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 uh that's a great uh, option because uh, i think working with an environmental isolate is the is the best thing to get our isolate from rather than just uh, getting it from a culture collection because number yeah. one i think because uh, the strain is already been adapted yeah to the, yeah, to the yeah. environment itself yeah that's right and, uh, i think in in joho we uh, we don't have a uh, hot thing and maybe if not for the thermal files mm. yeah but hello files yeah we have a very huge coastal line here in joho yeah both yeah, in yeah. the west coast and also in the east coast okay bro yeah. do you when, yeah. when you do a sampling or selection for the microbes for a certain yeah. trait do you have mm. any um, uh, certain microbes that can uh, possess uh, more than one species for example it is a good all degrader and at the same time it can also be a uh, good uh, like amylase enzyme of all kinds yeah yeah uh, uh, professor general thank you for uh, yeah your very good question and uh, i i said that yes your coastal line of johor is actually good for hemophilic i think um so in general my experience has been that they are polyextremic actually mostly so you see they will have more than one kind of extremity let's say they are alkaline or they are salt tolerant and maybe heat heat stable also so normally they are polyextremic because extreme conditions are normally come come they come together so that is one your second part is may they may have more than one kind of enzyme which is good yes they will have more than one kind of so for instance protease lipase or amylase are basic enzymes they will be present but one of the bacteria can be predominantly protease producer may not produce as high amount of lipase as you want so you have to choose the isolates which are predominantly producing your kind of choice of enzyme so major so their major enzyme has to be the one which you want so predominant secretor has to be there you can screen one can screen that so we did a screening by agar plate assay firstly we saw that zone of hydrolysis of gelatin was more in one organism that means it is predominantly protease producer so we when we want a protease we'll pick up that organism another was good giving higher zone on the Uh, you know oil agar plate or tributyrin agar plate then it is good lipase producer then you will pick up for lipase okay bro uh, maybe uh, any question from our fb audience maybe the secretary can help out in this do you have any okay bro uh there is some uh, reservation for question uh, number 3 from uh, the, uh, the audience so maybe uh, further up to your uh, explanation just now about so in terms of industrial application um when when um, you get an issue uh, for you to uh, uh, be involved with industry in india when you your work or is it a requirement over there you need know, like, of course uh, when we start our work we have this idea that our research output will be utilized by the industry so is it a requirement over there for you to work with industry <laughs> um very good question um in our case uh, industry and academic interactions are not very strong uh, i think that is lacking lacking here Uh, we work on the laboratory and when we find something good we publish or we file a patent actually and that is normally is done but if i think that it has very important industrial application 
in our institute or in some of the institutions they have a industrial cell also so we go to industrial cell and say this research can be useful for this industry so they then try to contact some of the industry saying we got this product or process which can be useful for your industry if you have interest you can come up with us and we we have a incubation center actually so we can incubate with them and try to see how does it work with industrial at industrial level as an incubator actually this we do but yes the the way you you have it that industry starts with the beginning of the project actually so problem comes from the industry in your case and you work with industry to solve that our model is slightly lacking there we are not uh, that is strong uh, yeah, yeah bro. actually uh, more or less is the same scenario here in malaysia yeah, yeah. what we have is uh, a very strong support uh, from the industry also the ministry intervention yeah like yeah. the university we are under the ministry of our, our higher education so mm -hmm. like uh, we are quite fortunate in malaysia we have very strong support from yeah. the ministry and also various agencies government agencies that always uh, encourage the mm -hmm. direct involvement from the industry um, the research in the university so yeah. hopefully by uh, having our mous between iitd and utm being signed hopefully in, in the near future we yeah. can have uh, inter-institution collaboration mm -hmm. by involving uh, uh, yeah, industry yeah. as well and i'm happy mm -hmm. to share that in UTM we have uh, a couple of groups who are very strong mm -hmm. in uh, enzyme area one okay. is the one that we have here in the school of chemical energy engineering and okay. another one one that is uh, uh, in the faculty of science under the bioscience okay. Yeah, hopefully with uh, your group and your team over there in IITB can have a future collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first, so, I know, like, yeah. Th thank you for that. Actually, so government of India has also started some industrial programs now, but this will take time to come. We have a separate industrial pro research program from government of India, where they fund to you only if you have industrial partner. Wow. So that is beginning, and some some faculty member have been very successful. So uh, maybe uh, your model will also be uh, useful here. And I'm very thankful, and we would like to collaborate. And I th thank you for, for very much. We will go for MOU and whatever we can exchange the students, faculty, and I invite you and other faculty colleagues, Professor Rafiq. Any time you visit to India, please give me an opportunity to host you. Or we'll create something for you to come here to our institution. We can work together. We can sign the MOU, and it's, it will be great. And I still have memories of you, TM, when I visited. I was there with you and uh, officers and members from UTM. It was a great time. So I would like to invite all of you to the students also. Thank you. Yeah, Prof. Thank you very much for that uh, kind invitation. We would also like to come to your institution and uh, yeah. actually uh, meet the, uh, the more friendly people in IITD. Yeah. Okay, Prof. So, um, uh, with that, I think I would like to pass the session back to our uh, distinguished team, Professor uh, to yeah. the, the sound, uh, Prof. Uh, I know is a bit. Uh, a bit out, but uh, but it should be okay. Just uh, just want to say thank you uh, to uh, Dr. Zaino for moderating this session, and of course uh, thank you so much to our distinguished speaker, Professor Sunil Kumar Fadi, for accepting our invitation to speak at our distinguished lecture series. Uh, certainly nice to see those uh, very nice buildings that you show at the start of your lecture, and your terima kasih banyak banyak. Seems like uh, you know uh, some of the <laughs> languages in Malay. <laughs> so it's certainly great to see uh, uh, those pictures and your lecture as well. So, um, uh, Prof, if you are out and about here in Malaysia, do call us. Uh, you know, uh, because we want to show you around. And of course, if I were to be in India, I will uh, pay you a visit. 
So I guess uh, that's all uh, for now. And to all our yeah. viewers, uh, our global viewers, thank you for watching this English lecture series. Do stay tuned because we have many more lectures for you. Up uh, until then, bye for now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.